the world of the paparazzi, it's not treated very well, is it? I think people tend to think they're all a little bit, you know, on the edge and, uh, you know, taking these terrible photographs of celebs and that which uh, the celebs don't want them to take. But I think they do, don't they? But maybe we're about to learn that. But of course, when you live in that world and you take photographs and you meet people who are like, you know, in the wider world, you also realise what's going on. And what I'm hoping we are going to hear today is what it really means to be a paparazzo and some of the things that uh, Jack Ludlam has discovered in his travels. And I think it's going to be a real insight. Uh, and uh, many celebrities know exactly who Jack is. As he says himself in his bio, even if we don't, uh, there are many people in the world who do. Uh, and I hope we're going to learn a few secrets today. So I'm really looking forward to this. So give a big hand, please, for Jack Ludlam. Mm -hmm. Hello, thank, thank you for uh, um, asking me to talk here. There's uh, a lot of things that, uh, doing this job that I've experienced and it, it, I, I'm pleased to be able to say them. I come from a background prior to being a paparazzi. I've been doing that for 25 years. Prior to that, I worked in uh, the film business. Uh, I was a technician and uh, I really liked it because you didn't have to dress uh, a particular way. And I ended up being a sound recordist for a Japanese cameraman who was based in Paris. And the reason I'm talking about that is because of something he said to me once, which uh, I've never forgotten. And uh, so we used to do documentaries uh, on stuff that would be broadcast in Japan. Uh, at the time, the television production values were quite high and we used to be staying in hotels and and this, this guy was a really interesting man because we used to talk afterwards there was one time we were doing uh, a thing about crime in paris there was a serial killer on the loose they're just using that to tie into the story and so it was police cars zooming up and down and the director come over from japan my cameraman ruzo akiyama was his name he was based in Paris and he had a, a vast knowledge of all cultures around the world. And what happened was there was a dead body in a building. And the director said, we'll go in and film that with the police. And he said, no, we're not going to film that with the police. Nobody wants to see that. It's undignified and we're not doing it. And he was the cameraman. So later on in the... Uh, in the hotel, he used to talk to me a little bit, and he said, and he said do you know what a cameraman is? I said, you know, you know, cameraman, he says, it's a man. You have responsibility. You have to take that responsibility, and you know, the power of what you do is, is important, or what you don't do. And he actually said to me, because you can kill people with this. And I never forgot that, and, uh, and I try to remember that all the time. Anyway, consequently, I'll come back to the UK, um, Ruzo was back in Japan and I was a freelance cameraman in London. I didn't really get on with it because you had to apply yourself to all sorts of different things that commercially, you know, to make a living. And I thought, I, I, you know, I don't really want to do this. It was okay when I was doing sound because you didn't have to get concepts and things like that. And so I thought, what, what shall I do? I don't know. <clears throat> One day my father said to me, he said, why don't you do that paparazzi thing? And I said, no, 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 Dad, no, I'm not doing that. I'm lighting cameraman or something. You know, I, 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 I had that thing that it was, ooh, you know, and I don't know where I got that, probably from the media. So I thought, oh, yeah. So we had a little camera. I went down the library and I really learned how to expose it and things like that because I had to gen up on that. And, and we shoot film in them days. So it wasn't digital. And I went out with it. And after a, <laughs> after a week or so, I used to go to Mayfair. I started off at Langham's, got chatting to a driver. He said, oh, there's a place around the corner called Quagley Nose and things like that. And I went there and I, I got to know the doorman at the, at the, the Dave. And it was an interest. So w when nothing was happening, we chat to Dave. And I wasn't making a living at this, at this stage in the game. And then this chap walked down the road 
and I got this picture. And I thought, wow. I thought, wow. And I love David Bowie. And funny enough, coincidentally, the Japanese guy told me he spent uh, an evening with him because he was interviewing him about Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. And, and they'd, they'd done a bottle of scotch or something. I, I, David stopped drinking in there. But, and, yeah, this Japanese guy was really interesting. Why is it like this? And they, they, they look at things differently. So that was David. He'd come along, and I thought, oh, this is great. I, I was, there he is going back out afterwards. And he was in, it was just me there. And the other, when I was doing this, I was thinking, I don't want anyone else to see me here. So I tried to keep out of the way while I was waiting. Because if someone else comes along, that's it. It's not exclusive anymore. And the idea is to have pictures exclusive, if you can. Anyway, so that happened. I put it out, and um, a couple of weeks later, my dad, again, my dad, he's really, he's really he said, did you say you took a picture of David Bowie? I said, yeah. He said, mm, is this it? And it was in a, a magazine. I went, yeah. Oh, wow. I thought, you know, th this might work. This, how am I going to know? I thought, I, I, if I can make some money out of this as well and do it and, and be free because you're not working for anyone particular, this would be great. So uh, <laughs> I, mo I wumbled on with all that. And going out, London, walking around. No, I was doing nights mainly. You can't do night and day. You'll just mess yourself up. So I, was doing, I used to do a lot of nights, which was clubs, restaurants. And uh, I, I met this guy who was, uh, when I first met him, he was an odd chap, I thought. Right? Well, I'm a bit odd myself. But um, he, his, his nickname, for his anonymity, I'll call him Glasses. Because <laughs> he used to wear dark glasses even at night. They were optical Ray-Bans. And uh, I got chatting with him. And he was, very, he was a paparazzi as well. But he was very educated. And he'd been to all the really good schools. And he had, he had a, a handle on papers, which ones like what. and Because and, I was starting to learn this, you know, which paper you might present a picture to. So we'd team up now and again. And when you're working in twos, uh, we, we would do some pictures. And uh, what the thing that... that was remarkable about him. He was honest. Because in this game, some, you get, team up with someone and you say, and they say, oh, we've got uh, X amount for this. And they could have easily sold it several other places and you wouldn't know. But not with this chap. He was honest. He had this principle. And so, consequently, we, we've done okay because if I said, if I was selling it and I said it was X, there's no second question. No, is he ripping me off? And it was the same with him. And that sort of smoothed the path uh, a lot because it does go on that people are ripping each other off all the time in this game. Now, I don't know what the next slide is, but we'll see what it is. Ah, oops, gone back. Oh dear, how do I go back? Right, one, two, there we are. So, this was another color negative picture of Mick Jagger. And I, I, I like it. Actually, there's another guy trying to take a picture. They're being m mobbed by flashes. And I, I thought, oh, I was using a different lens, I thought, so I wumbled around and I wanted to actually take what's happening. And I really like that. It wasn't commercially uh, made money, but I just like that picture. It's kind of, I, I like it a lot. Now, so this is going on. Let's see what the next slide is. Ah. <laughs> we get there. There we are. Sydney. Oh. So this is... Uh, um, Beach and Place near Knightsbridge, which there was a couple of restaurants which was used by lots of Hollywood people and stuff. But he was just walking down the street, and somehow, I'm very bad at recognising people, to be honest, but I, I knew him, and he had the sort of 60s coat on, and that, well, he called me Mr Tibbs. And I just thought, oh, wow. Again, coincident the panache, because this guy, you know, he was a very important actor. What I used to do, and still do, is when I take a picture, You'd get it developed, and then I'd sit and look at it at home on the computer and think, what films has he done? Because uh, I can't spell very well, and I have to get the uh, spelling right, copy and paste, when you put it out, otherwise nobody will see it. And, and then you look up and you go, oh, wow. And uh, it was a pleasure to sort of discover, you know, things about people like this, real artists. And I, I loved it. And uh, 
I took a lot of time. And so then once I've done all that, I, inside the, the file now, you can put uh, the info of who took it and then that's how they know. It, back in these days though, you had to print it up and if it was good enough, you go to the paper itself and you see the picture editor and so you're standing there, this is your work and they might like it. And if they do, they make a deal with you. They're always straight up about that. Even if they do a deal on the telephone, it doesn't change. They're pretty good like that. So that was what we used to do, is take it to the picture editor, if it was good enough. You can't keep going in there. They're very busy. <laughs> and you don't want to be going in there with a load of old rubbish. So yeah, that, so that, that's how it sort of worked. Um, it's still film. I was reluctant to go digital, but eventually I had to. So if you wanted to, if you was out at night and you got something, you had to process it that night and there were processors open uh, in Wardour Street. And you go in there, you process, have a look at the negative, print it up and think, well, this has got to go out now because other people might have got something similar. And in one case, let's see what the next one is. Oh, hold on a second, here we go. Oh, this fella, oh, this fella was great. When he come, when he come to London, nobody got any sleep. He was just everywhere and rocking and rolling and he was a, a great guy. About three in the morning one time, he came out of a club and there was just me there and there was an autograph collector. And, the autograph, and I let the autograph collector get his thing and, and then before I do stuff, I, I, if, there's only one. And I heard him say to him, he said, thanks for giving us an autograph, Jack. And he went, hey, thanks for asking. And I, I thought, what a geezer, you know. What a geezer, what a chap. So, I, and I love his films as well, all that helped. So sometimes it's, a, it's, it's quite a pleasure. Here's another chap, but this is a later one. I'm still pre 9-11 timeline here, but you know, he fits in with top artists as far as I'm concerned. That's Charlie Sheen, and I you've only got a few seconds, and I'll, I'll try and get a picture that's nice if I can, and I, I like that one. What happened was, he was, he, he, he was good, he, he went to the BBC, and he knew there was a load of us outside, so he did, he come out and gave us a frame, and we'd all done that, bop, 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 bop. It was, it was, it was great. And so that, that was done. I went to the hotel, I knew where he was staying, and I thought I'll get him when he's coming in as well. So I did that, he goes in the hotel, he was doing a conference. And then the manager come out and, uh, and said, look, you know, Charlie wants to come out and have a cigarette and that, but because you're here sort of thing, is, you know, he, want, he wants to relax. I said, tell him I won't take any pictures. I've got good, good lovely ones here already, it's fine. So out he comes, <laughs> he gave me a cigarette <laughs> and we said, we're, we're having a chat and I said, oh, you know, I wasn't expecting an answer because we, 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 sometimes he doesn't know me. I said, I, I liked what you said about 9-11, Charlie, you know. And, um, you know, was, I, I was pleased to be able to say that uh, to him. And uh, he was cool. So that's Charlie. What's the next one? Oops, a daisy. Excuse this. Now, actors, big Hollywood. What I'm going to talk about is not always their fault because this lady here is uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. I saw this on a billboard in Spain a few years ago and I, I know what Jamie Lee Curtis is about and it isn't drinking. And I thought, how comes she's advertising White Label there? That's, she, she really, I'm, I'm sure she wouldn't want that, you know? So I think somehow in the deals that get done and the, the rights and everything, somehow her images ended up there. I thought that was strange, so I, I took that. And um, so, the next slide. Oopsie daisy, oh, oh dear. No, 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 back here. There, Keith. This again, a great artist. It's a pleasure to take pictures of Keith. What's happened here is he's just come out of a door in a hotel this girl's gone, oh, wow, Keith, and he gave her a kiss. <laughs> and he's like, hello, love, and, and she's like, gobs. So I, this is the sort of thing I like. It's not really commercially pap stuff, but 
you know, I like, I like all that. And uh, everyone I know takes a picture of Keith or whatever time, really enjoys it. And, and uh, uh. Now, he's, I've got this little clip from him of something he said back in 1988 to do with the music industry, which I'd like to play. What is the most important thing in your life? Living. <laughs> Anybody else would be an idiot to say otherwise. You have a life, you live it, yeah. Um, beyond living, uh, to be able to make some good music and to be able to continue to, to do so, uh, it's important to me. How has the rock industry changed during those years you've been in it? Or has it changed anywhere? Uh, there's been a lot of changes, uh, but at the same time, things change and they don't change, you know. When I started, it was a very small business, comparatively. A small PA. And no PA. Yeah. At all? None at all, yeah. And uh, 69, the Rolling Stones never worked with a PA. But um, it's changed in other respects from... I mean, from the point that of... From when the Beatles and the Stones started, uh, you basically working with record companies that, and a lot of them still are. They're building. Uh, it, there, it's a tax write-off. Yeah. It's, um, it was something to uh, save some money to make records. It was a small part of their operation. They're making missile or guidance systems, uh, heavy electronics. EMI, DECA, uh, these big companies, RCA, their main business is somewhere else, and the, the record company end of their business is, uh, if you make some Bach and some Beethoven records, you could then write off some on tax, cultural tax. So to pay for that, they would make pop records, make rock and roll records, to make the record company pay for itself. Uh, now it's just enormous. The bit, you know, some of those companies, the record business is the biggest part of their business, and uh, so things change. The ratio of uh, of good stuff and bad stuff doesn't change either. Right? Ninety-seven bad, three good. <laughs> uh, Keith, lovely heavy electronics. Now, the cult of celebrity, in order to make a living, you've, you've got to take pictures which sell in the newspapers and the magazines. Uh, I like doing the great artists and everything, and, but they're not always... So someone might say to me, oh, the papers like her. Or, like, and I, and, I, and I, I've, I've never answered that question as to why, <laughs> particularly with certain things. And there is a place for pictures of celebrities, perhaps in magazines and a, a little bit, but it's been blown out heavily, way off of, of, of its rightful place. I've done a magazine interview once and I said, you know, sometimes I think it's a bit like a smoke screen or something, a bit of a, a diversion. Um, and uh, anyway, we go on to the next picture. I got a call to go to a restaurant in Mayfair and said Robbie Williams was in there. There was a few other photographers there and uh, I thought, right, okay, so we wait. Out he comes and I got this, which was... Uh, not a tricky picture, they did that right in front of me. The other guys had previously done this couple and then were doing some other people that come out, so they missed this. And uh, I said to my man Glasses, I said, do you know what, I think we've got an exclusive here. Because I could, you can't see it, it's still film. So we better get down and have a look because they're going to put their stuff out straight away. So the time, when it's not exclusive, it's time... You've got to act straight away. So we got it pr printed out, and I said, well, yes, I've got, I've got that. So we went to Wapping. I'd done a deal with the newspaper. Um, but I didn't really expect it to... But this is where it ended up. Front page. 
which, as a pack with competition and everything, is great. But I do remember thinking back, I said, well, this is front, this is, uh, why is it on the front page? You know. But, you know, it was good for business, and uh, I, I thought about it much more later on as I went on. Four years later, in October 2002, Robbie signed a deal with EMI, which is the biggest recording deal in British history, for 80 million, making him one of the highest paid singers in the world. It's not bad money. Now, again, we're still on negative here. Another thing that was happening at the time was the Spice Girls. And if you took a picture there, you know, you'd get it in the magazines. They liked it. So about two o'clock in the morning, we're wobbling along, me and glasses. Behind Regent Street, there was a club. And along comes walking this young lady. It was Victoria Beckham. We started taking pictures, but she said, no, no, hang on. And then she's done that, which was great for us, because this sells. That's Victoria Beckham. Later on, she was a little bit less obliging, and she got very famous. But here's another one. Oh, there's another one there. That was at Elton John's birthday party. And that, I was, there was 10 or 12 guys there. Luckily, one guy there, his camera jammed. The other one ran out of film, and up, bang. And so that went everywhere. Um, you know. Here's another, another Spice Girl. This is a later picture, but it's Jerry. She's reading now. I, I, I thought to myself, oh, the kids might like that, you know, reading. And, but it didn't really sell very well. When, when I started sort of thinking about all this, I've come across this clip, which is a, a lot. Let me show it to you, and I'll, and I'll talk about it afterwards. Jerry Halliwell uh, is a woman of intelligence, of energy, commitment, passion. One thing she's passionate about, passionate about is women's empowerment and equality. So she's a natural fit with our three organizations, with the United Nations Population Fund, MSI, and Population Concern. Um, and we're delighted to welcome her as UNFPA's Goodwill Ambassador in the UK, Jerry Halliwell. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. I'm very, very proud to be here this morning. So far away and ask me about being Goodwill Ambassador for United Nations Population Fund. So far ahead. I think the fact you're no longer part of the group limits your ability to propagate the message of the Population Fund. Well, at the end of the day, you know, that's all relative, it really is. But I think, at the end of the day, I am famous, okay? Lots of people know who I am. And I am damn well going to use my fame positively. You know, if I can bring, away, if I save one person's life just by awareness, I'm going to damn well do it. I don't care what, you know, you know whether I'm famous or enough. If just one person recognises me and thinks, well, actually, you know, it's going to bring attention, and that's good enough for me. Yeah, well. So the United Nations Population Fund, I won't go into it too much, but there's been a lot of controversy. It's about sterilizations that are happening in South America and, and, and stuff, and there's been a lot of kickback. But, but the, I ask myself is, how, how does this come about? Why, why does she go and do that? What, what, I don't think she knows uh, what to... Do you wake up in the morning and say, oh, I think I'm trotting down to the United Nations? Victoria Beckham does a lot of work with it as well. Uh, I, and it, their uh, Spice Girl thing was girl power and, uh, and all this. And, uh, you know, I, I, I wonder sometimes. Now, the Spice Girls. So... Commercially, it's money. If you take pictures of the Spice Girls, th th you're probably going to sell them. So I need to pay the mortgage. I need to get... So I'm... what happened was they were making the movie by the Albert Hall. I'll just tell you this as a little story. They're making a the movie by the Albert Hall. So I went down there. Of course, a lot of other people had the same idea. And it, it, it was um, a public space, but they kind of cordoned it off. 
And what we would like to do is get some pictures of making the movie, because they sell. What they took to, and they do this sometimes, is paying people with big umbrellas to stand right across and they, oh, no. you're not going to get any pictures when it's like that. They're on you. you know. So I was just about to pack it all in. I thought, oh, all right, I'm going to go. I'm not, I don't like all this merry dancing. And I saw a, a, an area down there with some railings, and this guy was shifting a, a beer barrel. And I said, hello, mate. He said, yeah. I said, what, what is this place? He said, oh, it's a students' union bar. I thought, huh? So there's a university right there. I thought, hang on, I'm not going to give up just yet. So I put the camera away, walked through the university, it was an arch, and found my way to the students' union. <laughs> and so I said to the guy at the students' union, I said, listen, I'm having a lot of trouble trying to take some pictures out there. Is there a chance I could use a window or something? And, 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 he, and he said, no, no problem, mate, you can have the roof. He said, now, I thought, great. So. I come up on the roof, I'm still shooting film here. Up on the roof, bang. The game's changed a bit now, I'm getting something. Not great, but something. And again, here's Victoria Beckham. You know, this is stuff they didn't really, the film company probably doesn't really want to do. So I'm up there shooting away, it's like fishing about. I thought, well, you know, this is great. And of course, I got rumbled. Behind me <laughs> appeared a security guard who <coughs> worked for the building, and s some heavy American producer types. And right, okay, you are, uh, okay, well, if, if you rumbled, you, you know, I'm going to leave the building. But it, we want the film. I said, that, that, that's not going to happen, right? We want the film, or we're calling the police, and it was very, very heavy. I said, well, you're not, I'm not giving it to you, right? Um, and I knew the law, you didn't have to. So, uh, they called the police, uh, and a nice Bobby come along. And he knew the law as well, so, <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, and so they said, we should get the film off him. And uh, so I said, listen, I, I, I want to talk to you, but not in front of these guys. So I said to the policeman, I said, look, I wasn't trespassing. I, I was actually allowed in there, but I'm not going to give them the guy's name because he's going to get in trouble. You know? And he said, uh, he said, don't worry. So he goes back, he said, we can't take the film off him, it, it's his property, you know, that's the law. And then the coppers come over to me, oh, so they, they had to go, the copper said, did you get any good pictures? I said, yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, my experience with bo police bobbies and that, it's been, it's been fine, it's been really good, actually. They, they helped me out with something uh, a little bit later on I'm going to talk about. So this is a picture, it's later, but it, it sort of sums up for me, I, you know, she's in the limelight. She's right up there. And I like, I like that picture. Nobody used it, actually, because it might raise those questions. I, I don't know. But I just thought, you know, she's, it must be a lot of pressure. You're fronting things. And the question that I asked is, if it wasn't her, you see, I'm not blaming her for anything or saying it. If it wasn't Victoria Beckham, for instance, would it be someone else? And my answer that I think would be yes, it would be someone. That it it's, it's, seems that way. So it's Victoria Beckham. Now what's the next slide? Let's have a look. Right, I'm just going to show you a few pictures of what standard paparazzi fodder is. And, uh, you know, just run-of-the-mill stuff, which magazines like to use. I, I sort of noticed as well, I used to try and shoot for ladies' magazines, women's mags, because most of the people going after the A-list of full-on, but th there was a big market for the magazines, and I, I just think, well, that, that's, that's good. So this will be the sort of thing. That's Kelly Brook, and she's in a dance shop, which again is a bit show-busy, and she's buying a few bits and bobs. I saw the, how that come about, for instance, I was walking along, I knew what car she was driven around in. She was going out with a major Hollywood actor at the time. And um, I thought, well, oh, right, okay. And then you finish it off with a long shot, top to bottom, coming out, and that's it. And doing that stuff is bread and butter. It's not particularly uh, fascinating, but there's a market for it, and that's 
stuff you do, which I can't say is artistic, but it, you know, that's what paparazzi sort of stuff is. What one tries to avoid, where possible, is this kind of thing. This is Kylie, and a lot of times it, it will t things can just turn into this sort of stuff. It's hard work. It's, it's, you don't really want to be doing that if you can help it. There's sometimes that you might want to take a picture of a the person, there's lots of other people there, as, as in Posh Spice. So this is the sort of thing that I would like to say is a proper picture. She just had her hair permed, right? So no one had seen that. And that was exclusive. And she was actually very nice. The driver sort of went to get in the way and said, no, no, it's all right, let him. About, I don't know, half past 12 at night in the West End, she'd been in a club and she was, she was sweet. So that's, that's a packed picture which sold. And of course with Kylie, there's Australia as well. Now what's the next slide? Ah, yes, no. I wanted to show you this one because that is Michael Madsen. He was in Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, I think. Was it in Pulp Fiction? Anyway, he's a major actor. He's done that for me, you know? He's, he's, giving you a, he's giving it away. He plays tough guys and... So I, 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 he knew I was there and he, he's mucking about with the, one of the crew. He did that and I, I really like that sort of thing. So he, he knows the value of his thing and he's sort of doing you a favour. Do you know what I mean? There you go, mate, have that. And so I, I, when I was um, editing it and saving it and whatnot, it didn't really sell, but I, I, I like that. I, I, I looked him up because I'm fascinated about films uh, and actors. In some way, if, if, if there was a cameraman, for instance, his work, if it's conscientious or whatever, gets to see other things that you wouldn't normally in a normal, uh, and, and the picture of life becomes wider. And, I, I, and, and in some way, with, I think with actors, they can get into a role and learn about it, learn about the things, and then sort of produce that as if it was effortless. And this I find fascinating. And uh, I, 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 so I'm sometimes hard to watch a film with. <laughs> but when I can watch a film and I don't see the joins, and it's an interesting movie, I, I, I love that sort of thing. So I was, I was editing that, and I looked him up, and I started reading about him. And when he did the scene in uh, Pulp Fiction, was it? No, Reservoir Dogs. And it was quite a brutal scene. He uh, had a lot of trouble getting himself into that role. And he's, he writes poetry and everything. And, uh, and it was just like, I was interested to know about that. Now, I used to work a lot in the, in the West End. I loved it down there. And I used a pub called Coach and Horses. Perhaps a bit too much. Actually, a lot too much. But there we are, right? This was something that happened that totally changed everything. That's 9-11. They never have the television on in the pub. But on that day, that evening, they did. And that's everyone just watching it. Because I don't normally take pictures in pubs and that, but you know, I tried to make an exception. And that 9-11, I thought, oh, wow. I couldn't, couldn't, what's going on? This is very serious. And the mainstream thing, and I, I was trying to, uh, and it affected everything. There was no work to be done anyway, because, you know, the papers are just full of this all the time. So I used to go to the pub. And, uh, and, but it was it, it really, and, and this isn't New York, this is London, but New York. It was tra 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 traumatized um, everyone, and I thought, what is going on? I started to think about it. And it's because of the alternative media, which is so important that, you know, the, the original narrative of what happened there, the official one, the, you know, it's taken apart with, because of alternative media. And I think it's really important. I won't go into the thing exactly. I think you will, most of you know. 
Um, right. So I'm in the pub a couple of months after, and I see over there, there's a friend of mine who I knew, who was a director, and he's talking to Matt Dillon. Right? Oh, man, Matt Dillon, that's a major A-lister. And I, get out, and I was going to sort of find a way of get, getting a picture of Matt. Anyway, as I got up, he said, Jack, let me introduce you to Matt. Oh, wow. So, so I said, oh, Matt, oh, we've got you. I said, you know what I'd do and that. He said, yeah, he said, I'd do your picture, no problem. And we went outside and out the way, he'd done it, just bump, bump, picture of Matt. And I thought, oh, that's great, what a nice guy. And he was, he was, he was really nice. Then we chatted a bit more and, um, you know, that was done. The next day, or maybe one or two days, I think it was the next day, in the afternoon, I walked back in the pub again. There's Matt sitting over there. Jack, how are you, mate? <laughs> Hello, Matt, and everything. And I got chatting with him. We didn't talk shop or anything. And I did say to him, this is sort of the beginning of when I started to look into 9-11 and, you know, the media and everything. And this is one of the, one of the little light bulbs. That, doesn't it? It's not a massive revelation or anything. But he said to me, he said, you know, he said, because uh, I wanted to sort of see what an American perspective was as well. And I, I mentioned it. I said, well, yeah. He said, no, he said, me and my friends, some of us were talking about it. Isn't it funny, weird, not funny, weird, that this dollar sign used to be, and, and very often used, two, two strokes down it, September 11. And I just thought, and first of all, I went, those dastardly Bin Ladens, oh, they think of everything. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, it, it, it's not a revelation in itself. But I, just, oh, I, and I, I started to look more into it. More into it. And, uh, you know, found out about Helgelian dialectics and, and how stuff is manipulated and this and that. One of my attitudes was, is if someone's interested in someone's handbag, what shoes, good luck, I'll take the pictures, and, you know, I, I don't really care. But, but you know, so, sometimes I think there's a bit more going on, you know. Well, there is, actually. You know, so, so, post 9-11, I noticed that everything was different. And it particularly struck home to me. I, I, I found out they were filming the Bourne Ultimatum in Waterloo, which was Waterloo uh, International. It was a Eurostar at that time. And I thought, I would love to get some pictures of that. I was using a little headset and I could hear the radio transmissions of the crew. I thought, well, but the thing is, because of terrorism and everything, that everyone's going to be... So I don't really want to be spotted if I can help it. So they were filming something over there. I'm saying, I don't take the camera out. It's a long lens anyway. You, when you, if you're shooting a film set, you don't really want to get in the actor's eye line. You don't, want to, you don't want to influence it in any way that it might disturb them. You know, that, that, that's the truth. Because, they, you know, they're doing a job. And you want to try and take the pictures that your presence isn't affecting them. Right? That, that's, that's something I've tried to stick to. And so the old radio cracked up and they were filming there. Oh, when they were filming this, the director, they were shooting it. The station was open, everyone walking around. These were normal people. And in the midst of it, they were filming this, which was wow, wow. So it wasn't all controlled. It was, and the radio cracked up. I thought, oh, no, I'm going for a take. And, but what I was seeing wasn't what I was hearing. So, oh, oh, Christ. They're doing two at the same time. There's two shoots going, I've got, I've got to find the other one because that's where Matt Damon is. Because he wasn't in this bit. I thought, oh, so I'll frantically go around searching and everything. And there's, there it is, it was on a platform. Now I can't go onto the platform obviously because it's crewed up, then, you know, you're being shot and everything. I oh, know, I'll go to the next platform and see if I can see something there, which I did. Uh, as I went through, I, I think the guy, because he saw my headphone, he thought I was part of the crew, the ticket guy. <laughs> oh, no, mate, yeah. 
So I've gone through and I'm waiting and, and then it goes. And I, I like this shot. There he comes, down there and blah, blah, blah. So I, I, I've had to take the camera out obviously now and I've been seen. And there's another one there. There he goes. So I've got really what I come for. But I was approached then by, this is the sort of thing that was started to happen more and more. I was approached by one of the crew. He said, if you take that camera out again, we're going to have you arrested and removed under the Anti-Terrorism Act. Right? I thought, and it was a bit argy-bargy, actually. I said, I said, I said, I said you what? He said, we will have you removed under anti-terrorism laws. I, said, no, I won't say exactly what I said, because I swore. But um, anyway, the policeman was about, and I said, is that right? He said, yeah, it is. You can't take pictures in stations now because they might be casing it or something, you know. I thought, well, I thought, well I've got what I've got. But they, it really struck home uh, how things were changing now. And th I discovered there were so many laws that crept in under the, that people didn't even know about, but which can be used post 9 11. Hundreds. Uh, well, I just thought that was a bit strong. It wasn't the first time this happened as well. It was another incident. I, I used to, I'll tell you, I used to have a bike and I'd sometimes pop it there and on the pavement and I saw what I thought were two traffic wardens coming on and I, I was just about, to, oh, oh, they weren't, they were the plastic policemen or whatever you call them. I said, oh, sorry, I thought you were traffic wardens. And um, so I just come up and said, oh, who are you waiting for? And I said, well, I, I, you know, to be honest with you, I can't tell you that. It's not a big secret, but it's just policy. You don't, for all I know, your brother's a paparazzi. Yeah? Well, and she said, I had a big lens. And I said, oh, right. So we, we've got on a bit like that now. We, we, I wasn't in the best, I try and avoid confrontation. You know, there's no good going through your day, get, getting in arguments and everything. So I tried, but on this time, I, I, I sort of, I didn't. And um, so she asked me for my identification. And I said, why do you want to see that? And she said, well, you know, terrorism uh, area. I said, what are you talking about? I said, I'm a photographer. I'm outside a television station. What are you talking about? Why do you need to see my ID? And she was breaking in the new guy. There were two of them. And I thought, oh, no, I'll see what happens. I said, I, I don't want to show it to you, to be honest with you. I, I don't like you. And uh, I'm not, I'm not going to. I don't respect your authority, quite frankly. <laughs> and... Uh, and she said, if you don't, we're going to call the police. I said, you're having a laugh, aren't you? No, we're going to call the police and they will search you and they will do this and that and the other. And I said, you're really telling me that you want to waste my money, your money, the police time over this because we, we've got an ego thing for going with each other or whatever. I said, yeah. And I said, I don't... I, and I was waiting there, and said, sure enough, please come. OK, right, OK, what's your name, this, that, the other, search me, run from my pockets, the whole lot. All because of this new terrorism law, which I'm, I really think I'm not a terrorist, and I've got a camera, and I'm outside the TV station. This is happening more and more and more. I thought, bloody hell. But I, I also wanted to complain about that. And I, when, I, when I tried to go through the channels, it was very, very difficult. I was getting nowhere. There was no way of doing it that wouldn't take so much time. So I just let it go. But that was happening quite a lot, that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, so I pressed the wrong one. Uh, so with, with, with that, post 9-11 come surveillance and the emergence of enforcement. I was seeing this everywhere, the word enforcement. Previously, someone was a ticket collector or inspector and they're going around, now it's ticket enforcement. Oh, God, that's a bit strong, isn't it? Everything had enforcement written on it. Here's one, here's one. Uh, this was in my road near where I lived in Islington. I used to come out and there was one of these walking along, checking cars. And it was a congestion chargement, charging enforcement officer. 
I was, I was, I was, this is going nuts. And I was like, what? And also, uh, in 216, for instance, I, I was using the underground, and, uh, and uh, there was a big red sign, alert! I thought, what do you mean, alert? So I read it, and it said, you know, it gets hot down there in the summer sometimes. If the train, it's a good idea to carry water. But it was alert, big red. So why couldn't it just say, you know, it might be a good idea to take some water with you, but no, on your spear calls, alert. All right, we're all very alert today. And so all this stuff. This is a little frame I did of what these, these were appearing all over the place. And that was on top of a car, you know. I put them out, but the you know, papers are... I can't tell the papers what to print. I'm not really very interested in all this. And uh, again, these were everywhere. All over the place. Sometimes we used to follow them and start taking their picture for a laugh. But, um, but uh, So something was definitely happening. It was real. And, and, and I think it sort of agitated everyone. Uh, and, and, you know, the general people were on edge, on edge more. I was getting tickets from cameras, nine o'clock at night, no one around. I'd think, I'm going into this little uh, supermarket. I'll put the bike on the pavement over there. You know, because I'm not going to leave it in the way of anyone. I'll just, and I'll pop in and I'll get my bits and come out. I did, and I did that. And a ticket would appear from some camera. That was 90 quid, that one. This was going on all the time. And it was costing me a fortune, so I, was, I eventually said, I'm not paying them anymore, so I worked away. But um, what I, I, I wanted to find a way around this, right? And I seriously considered this. There's my new registration, right? <laughs> And I, I was working out, uh, do I know any Arabs? And uh, how do we get, go, get over to an Arab country, register the bike, la la la. And when you they haven't got the buttons on the machines for this, right? And I don't think the camera technology is up, up on it anyway. And again, I was, I was chatting to a policeman about all this because it, oh, it, was, it, was, it was very heavy all, all the time. And, it, and the policeman, fair enough, it was a bobby in the West End, he said, you know what? He said, um, if you cover the registration and it's not on the highway, it's not illegal. And I said, is that right? He said, yep. He said, that's right. I said, that's a bloody good idea. My accountant was in Brick Lane, which is uh, an Indian area, and there's a lot of leather factories and stuff. I was talking to the accountant. I said, do you know anyone who makes leather? He said, yeah, it's lovely. And they said, but if you go and see this fella here. And uh, so... This was my solution, which I loved. The registration gimp mask, which pop that on, put a little padlock on, off the highway, it mustn't be on the highway. That was the only stipulation. And that caused a lot of stewards' inquiries because they'd come along and, oh, what do we do now? On the radio, and then about three more would come along. And I said, is this your bike? I said, there's nothing to do with you. Don't worry about it. And then they'd try and peek down it. And I said, no touching, criminal damage, right? <laughs> so I loved this. this. This was a great idea. And, I, and that worked. The only problem with it was sometimes I would be doing something and I'm going to follow a car. And I'll forget to take it off, you know. <laughs> or I didn't have time. So I'm now driving around with, with that. But, but luckily, I didn't get a tug for that. I mean, but I, I'm a bit dizzy sometimes. I, I went two blocks. I got up one day and I went two blocks and I realised I hadn't got a helmet on, you know. Oh, what shall I do? Shall I take the bike? I don't know. Park the bike, go back and get the helmet. Anyway, so, yeah. Now, th th this, this next picture here appeared. This is... Because uh, I, I wouldn't mind paying a pound if I was going to leave it there or whatever it was. This appeared... Now, it does not sound very important, no, a parking meter, but what it means to me is this is now a pay-by-phone area, see signs for information, and this will be the sign. There's a major thing. And with all the tickets I got, this is basically a hand-yourself-in notice, but, um, <laughs> but I found out also if you're taxed, insured, and legally parked, they're not gonna, they can't do nothing. 
So I thought, I sent those out, just, you know, stock to pay. There's not a story there for them, but there, there is really, but I'm not sure sorry, that they wanted to talk about it. So I figured if I could tie this in with a celebrity somehow, maybe they'll get in and then they'll start asking questions about it because it means you can't park a car unless you have a mobile phone and a credit card. So now we've been directed down this avenue, which is control. Um, and, and, I, and I thought this is a... I'd, I'd like to try and get this in somehow, but I, I, it's not my newspaper. So, along comes this chap, and I thought he's an intelligent guy. It's Cat Stevens, lovely singer, love his stuff. And he's, got, he, he's, he's seen this as well, and he's having the same problem. It took him 25 minutes to get that done, but there he is. Well, oh God, you know, he wants to park his car, and I think he was going to play guitar somewhere. But I, I, I liked it was him because he's it, intelligent. I like Cat Stevens, he's old school. And I thought maybe that will go in somewhere because then, then they can talk about why we have to have a mobile and a thing. He knew what I was doing. He, he, was, he, he copped onto it. And he said something to me afterwards which I thought was quite profound. He just said, it seems that in this world you don't exist unless you've got a credit card. You know, and I think he might have used his mates or I don't know. But, but I, you know, that, that would be a slightly more important thing. It went nowhere. But I'm glad I did it because I've got that now. <laughs> so... so. Um, there we are. Oh, oh, this is, this, this is not... I, I know big issue sellers and things in Bond Street. Some of them are very intelligent people. And uh, I was chatting to some of them around Mayfair. They were having a drink in a pub outside, hot summer's day. And I looked over and I saw that. HSBC Bank, the world's local bank, that's on a police car. And I thought... And they're always getting pulled in for all sorts of things, you know, uh, HSBC. I, what are the bank doing advertising on a police car? Well, we pay for that, don't we? And I thought, so what happens if there's two bank robberies at once? We'll go to them first. Well, <laughs> is that the game? I could. I, I, and, and, and then the big issue guy said, I'm with the HSBC. I said, go on then, let, let's, let's jazz this up a bit. And so we've done that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that didn't go very... That, they didn't go in the press. <laughs> and, uh, right. No, so... I, I actually I was annoyed one day. I think I sent one to HSB, asked them if they want to buy one for the office. And, uh, and, um, so g going around doing this, you, you, you do, you get to see lots of different things. And here's an example, you know, on Cavendish Square, there's a helicopter landing. Oh, well, I'll have to do this then, you know. Fortunately, no one was actually, uh, it wasn't an emergency or something, it was a false alarm. Now, he didn't get a ticket, so I gave him one of mine. <laughs> I had loads. Yeah. No, it's just a little silly story thing. Five minutes, all right, okay. Right, I'm going to skip the X Factor, but which will quickly be this. I was thinking I was going to run, uh, finish early. But there's the X Factor, blah, blah, blah. It's in Great Queen Street, they're doing the interviews. All the kids are happy, da, da, da. We're going to get some sanitised stars coming out of that. And here's quickly them. They're bussing them in by the thousands. You know, it's, it's like oh, chaos. And, uh, you know, I wanted to sort of take a picture and note that. Quickly, Keith Floyd, lovely. Do we remember when cooking was about fun and everything? What is it now? Like, oh, I've got to get through, right? And they're all scared and fear-based, and you take something. This guy made it fun. It's now a sort of competition and, and everything. That's a quick one here. Ashvin Ratanzi. I used to know him back, I uh, still do. And, and, and he was a friend, but I didn't realise what he was doing. He was like, oh, I thought, oh, yeah. But now I do, because he'll have people on, like John Pilger. And I've gone back and looked at all John Pilger's work. I think, oh, this guy is great. He'll have John Pilger on. He went in and interviewed Julian Assange. And you have to go and look for this stuff because it won't appear on the given normal stuff coming in. And so people like Ashvin and his program on Russia Today, 
is very important because they will let people get a window to tell some truth, which is just going to be somewhere else. You don't see too much of John Pilger's stuff. It's great. It's a, there was a quick clip there, but if we've only got four minutes, I'll skip that little clip, yeah? And then... Um... What about the... Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, where are we? Oh, dear, I don't know what I've done there. Slide. No, no, not slide. Play. Ah. Oh, I one button too far. Thank you. Thank God for good technicians, eh? Oh. Thank you. Now, a great artist. He, he's actually been on Russia Today, uh, interviewed by... This is Jimmy Cliff. And I, I, I saw him. I had to follow him on the bike because I wanted to get him. But I was going to miss him. I said, hey, Jimmy, put your hands in here, sir, and you'll get no harm now. And it's lovely. He's done this. And I, uh, this is a real artist. Uh, Jimmy Cliff, he made a beautiful song about Vietnam. Uh, back in the day, and uh, I thought, you know, this is what we need, real artists, not some too corporate and, and such, but Jimmy Cliff. And uh, when, it, when I take a picture like that, it doesn't sell, but I, lo I love it. It's a, it's a nice day. And on that, I'll kind of wrap it up, I guess, and uh, thank you for letting me talk. Um, I hope, hope something that might have come out of it, and that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Jack Lundlund.